Unfortunately, John Liskey couldn't be here today. Fortunately, we have Dick Martin and Gary Finke. Um, Richard Martin is a man of many accomplishments. He's the director of the Extension Supervising 4-H and Extension faculty in 19 Northwest Ohio counties. He's a retired associate professor of emeritus from OSU, former president of his 4-H club, the High Voltage, and eighth grade class president. <laughs> <laughs> he was born and raised in O'Carver, son of a school teacher and farm service agency mother. After graduating from OSU, he moved to Wood County, but he never lost his passion for the Ottawa County. He still owns part of his family farm, which has been in the family for 150 years. And Gary Finke, hi Gary. He's a son of a pharmacist, born and raised in O'Carver. He returned to O'Carver after graduating from college to teach industrial arts, where under his leadership, his students built and lived in a light, light space shuttle simulator. The six astronauts spent two years planning the 72-hour mission. Um, Gary's usually found in the Oak Harbor Local History Museum Center, pouring over old copies of the Ottawa County Exponent, sorting through local memorabilia, and researching the history of Ocarva. And when he's not there, he's working on the restoration of the Ten Goose. Please welcome Dick Martin and Gary King. The computer's here, but I think I can advance it okay. myself. But I need you for a backup. Yeah. Okay. As, as you, uh, let me get my notes here. As was mentioned, John Liskey is, is really the brains of this outfit. And um, he's not here. He, uh, he had surgery um, about two weeks ago, I think, and is recovering. But uh, he still is not feeling up to getting out and doing things like this. So in the past, when we have um, done this program, we've done it a couple times. Uh, once for the Genealogy Society and once for the Oak Harbor Library. Uh, John and I have kind of bantered back and forth and what I'd forget why he would fill in and Gary was the guy who advanced the slides because we didn't have these handy dandy little clickers which may not work after Linda has dropped it. Um, so if Gary we may need you to advance slides we'll find out. Uh, again thanks to Linda Hostler for the introduction. I can't say enough about the uh, Oak Harbor Library and the museum. If you have not been there, it, it would be wonderful for you to come by and look at it. There is a new mural that was put in about a year ago when, as you go down the stairs to the museum. Uh, it's a history of Oak Harbor in pictures. Uh, it's, it's amazing, the, the detail that they have in that, in that picture. Um, and I like it because my grandfather's picture's in it, too. So, uh, um, you're all in the back room. Okay, another, another one going to be in the back room. So when that's done, why well, be sure to come over and, and see that. And, and Lisa does so much there, as does Kathy Huffman. Um, the, the, I guess, historic, what, what, is, what is her title, Kathy's? I don't know. Okay, well, she works there. She, she does a very good job. She, uh, Oak Harbor Library and Museum has a Facebook page. If you've never been on it, you ought to go on and, and sign up for it. They do a, uh, a wonderful job. Uh, Kathy does periodically this week in Oak Harbor history where she goes back and pulls stuff out of old exponents, which Lisa apparently did to find out I was eighth grade class president. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> um, and Gary, his expertise is really Weller's, the Jay Weller Company. Uh, and he has a presentation on the Jay Weller Company, which is a tomato and uh, pickle processing plant in Oak Harbor, but was all over the, all over the Midwest also. And uh, he recently got, um, I guess you got the safe donated, or? The, the, contents, of safe. the contents of the safe were, do were donated to the library. And Gary says he has over a thousand pages that date back into the 1890s uh, of the history of the plant and everything about it. So that's uh, uh, something that you may want to have as a program a year or so down the road when he gets through those thousand pages. But for this afternoon, we're going to visit the uh, Toledo, Port Clinton, and Lakeside Railway. Um, in fact, we're going to take a ride on it, I guess you would say. Uh, we're going to start, if I can get this thing to work, up here, start here in Toledo, come down to Genoa, Elmore, Oak Harbor, cross the river, and then up here in Lakeside and Marblehead. Um, 
and I will give you more details as we go on. Now let's see if this works. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> oh, there it worked. Okay, good. Did I go too far? Um, hold, let me check my notes. If I did, I two, two, or one. I think we're good. Okay, the interurban began in the late 1890s, uh, and it was a phenomenon that was all through Ohio and, and even through the Midwest. Uh, it was a fast alternative to to the steam trains, which were noisy and smelly and, and uh, were obviously fixed to certain areas. Um, it was powered by electricity, so it was clean, it was fast, uh, and it, it serviced areas that steam trains could not. It would go right through town, it would go, uh, you could flag it down as you were driving or as you were standing in, in front of your house, if it went by your house, you could flag it down. Um, it was primarily used to um, transport passengers although they did transport freight from time to time. And in fact, toward the end, that's all they transported was, was freight. And there was a, a broad network of interurbans around Ohio. Probably the other best known one around here would be the Lake Shore, Limit, or Lake Shore Electric, which went from Toledo to Cleveland uh, through Fremont, and I think Sandusky, I believe, yeah. yeah. And um, so that was an, of a bigger line, but um, this was Ottawa County's line and a little bit of Lucas. Uh, it lasted until 1939. Why do you think it ended in, at that time? Depression? Well, all these, yeah. Well, some of it was torn up for scrap. The rails were torn up for scrap uh, for the war, but primarily it was the automobile did it in. Um, people found it easier to hop in their Model T and drive to Toledo than to wait on the interurban train to take you there. Go on to the next one. Specifically, our line, the Toledo, Port Clinton, and Lakeside Railway, and it went by several names, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, it, again, was an interurban electric powered line. It served all of Ottawa County and a little bit of Eastern, and it was 52 miles long from um, uh, Marblehead to Toledo or, or vice versa. Here's a timeline on it, uh, and what amazes me about this timeline is uh, it went so fast. They were able to build this so quickly that uh, the, you think about a project like that today, it could not start and end in, in, in a couple years. Incorporated in 1902, ground broken in 1903, just four months later. The track laid in June of 1904, completed a Marblehead by the end of 1905. Uh, first passengers were uh, actually in August 28th of 1904. So think about that today. You'd have to have environmental impact statements. You'd have to have all these hearings. It would, it would be impossible to do something like that. Plus, remember, they had to get right away from 52 miles of, of a track of the owners of 52 miles of the right of way. So it's just, it boggles my mind to think of, that something like that would happen uh, that quickly uh, in today's society, because it wouldn't. And here's the line. Now, we'll spend just a little bit of time following it as we go here. Help if I turn it the right way. We'll start in Toledo, and the first few slides we'll have will be up here in downtown Toledo. It came down um, Main Street, across the Cherry Street Bridge, followed Star Avenue, past Pearson Park, angled along the Wheeling Lake Erie Railroad, through Curtis, Clay Center, Genoa, Elmore, followed the north side of the Portage River to Oak Harbor, through downtown Oak Harbor, crossed the river in Oak Harbor, followed the south side through Bay Township, through Port Clinton, down 4th Street, uh, and then we'll talk more about the exact route, but it went uh, along here and actually ended up through Lakeside here and went right by the street, right in front of our, of our uh, meeting place here, and then eventually down to Bay Point. Now the other point to make here, and I don't know if you can see this from if you're seated down because it's pretty low, but it went by several names. We talk about it being the Toledo, Port Clinton, and Lakeside Railway, but it was only that name from 1902 to 1912. Then it was the Northwest Ohio Railway in power for a few years, 12 to 24. Then 
most people remember it as the OPS, or the Ohio Public Service Line, from 1924 to 46, and then the Toledo and Eastern from 46 to 58. Now you may say, I thought the line ended in 1939. It did, but part of it did, not all of it. And we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, OPS, I remember my mother talking about taking, taking the OPS or take the streetcar uh, to Toledo, and probably some of your parents and grandparents would have written it known as, as the OPS. They had both passenger service and freight service. The uh, older passenger car is on the top left, and you can see it says inner urban car, Port Clinton, Ohio, on the top. It says, I think it says Toledo, Port Clinton, and Lakeside Railway. And then the passenger service, a newer car, is on the bottom. That was one of the last cars they had. Freight service, two engines that would pull freight cars. Um, the top one being an older one, the bottom one being a newer one. And by the way, I really didn't mention these tracks were all built to steam standards. So steam engines could also be on these tracks. Um, and freight cars that would be pulled by steam engines could be on these tracks. So you could pull freight, and you'll see spots here where the freight for the steam line joined a, the, the inner urban line. So you could transfer back and forth. You could take a car off this inner urban line, move it onto the steam line, and take it on wherever the steam line went. Yes? I forgot about the uh, standing on the north side, side of the Boyd River. Yes, thank you. Back in, see, that's why I brought Gary along. He's the brains of the bunch. <laughs> there, when you look in retrospect, this one, uh, you see we crossed the river at Oak Harbor and then followed here. If they would have stayed north of the river and followed and then crossed at Port Clinton, um, what is later developed right about here? Camp Perry. Camp Perry and EPG, Area Ordnance Depot. That didn't start until 19... Eight, I believe, roughly 1907, 1908. This was put in in 1904. So if they would have run the line instead of crossing at the river, which was at, at Oak Harbor, which was probably easier to cross because it was fairly narrow there, if they'd have stayed on the north side, you had World War II coming up, you, well, World War I, World War II. I'm guessing that they would have had much more profit if they would have taken the northern route rather than the southern route because they would have had the Camp Perry and the EOD and all the, all the passenger freight, passengers and freight that would have gone into those two in items. In the 1950s, they had over 5,000 employees at Erie Proving Ground. Yeah. Okay. So that would have been a, a wonderful... Uh, a yeah. lot, lot from Toledo, Wood County, uh, along with Oak Harbor and Port Clinton. Yep. So that would have been a... It was a, probably a mistake, as, as you look back on it, although they didn't know they made a mistake at the time. Uh, here's a passenger schedule. This is from 1926. Uh, and you can see the number of, uh, of trains that rent. There's the towns going to Toledo to Marblehead or Marblehead to Toledo. Um, you could leave Toledo at 11.40 p.m. at night. And uh, let's see, you got the a.m., the different, the different times there. Uh, so if you left, if you left Toledo, at uh, let's say 11:40 p.m., would that would get you what, what in the morning? Well, 12:23, and then Oak Harbor at 1 a.m. would come in. So if you're really tying one on late in Toledo at 11:40, you could still make it to Oak Harbor by 1 o'clock or to um, Port Clinton by 1:25. Vice versa, the other way. Um, you know, it cost uh, I believe what a dollar fifty I believe it was for. From Oak Harbor, and from Port Clinton, and a dollar twenty-five, I believe, from uh, dollar fifteen from Oak Harbor. So uh, round trip that was too. There were three different stations in downtown Toledo uh, that were used for the uh, inner urban for our inner urban. Uh, the bottom one being Superior and Adams, then the four hundred block of Superior, which was right there and then Superior and Jackson, which was there. The line came in, Cherry Street, and then down around and back up. And I understand from John, they actually went both ways. I mean, it, it, it changed at some point. They went one way or another 
point, they went the other way. None of these buildings are, are there anymore. Uh, Jackson Street here would be um, oh, the, the, the um, Toledo, yeah, no, that's down here. It would be where the, the, the um, yeah, no, nor even north of that. It would be where the, the top government building, one government center is, is right, of, at, one government center is north of Jackson. And so it would have been, yeah, right, right in there would have been where it was. Here's a couple of pictures of the Cherry Street Bridge, now the Martin Luther King Bridge, um, the track, and there you can see the inner urban going across the, uh, the bridge. There's the bridge, there is the Catholic Church that you see on the, um, be the west side of the bridge. Um, and here's the bridge later, today actually, uh, the old and new. Yes, yes, and cars and buggies and everything. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now this picture, if you're at all familiar with East Toledo, you'll recognize, because uh, these buildings, at least the ones here, are still there. This picture was taken um, actually in 1901. So the inner urban had not come through here yet, but you see a streetcar line. And that is part of the Toledo's streetcar, uh, their, their city transportation. So um, they, they used those tracks, they shared tracks. And so the inner urban later ran on that track. This building, this is the corner, this is uh, Cherry Street, which becomes Main Street when you go into East Toledo. Um, Front Street is across here. This building is still there, as is this building. These are gone. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is, if you ever cross there, the street isn't, is, is wider than this, because in 1930 something, they moved all these buildings back Anybody know how far? It was, it was like 15 feet or something to make the street wider. All the buildings were moved back. Many of them are gone today. But, and also notice the, uh, the, the, I suppose they were telephone poles back there and the street light up there. Yeah, could have been. Okay, now we're, we're at the first, uh, what I call the first stop, and that's Ryan. And that would be, if you can see on my little map over here, it would be right about there. Uh, it, as I said, it went down Cherry Street, which became Main Street. It turned onto Star Avenue, and then went straight east on Star Avenue to uh, the first stop being Ryan, which was the substation where they uh, got their, some of their power. Um, this is on Star Avenue uh, at the railroad for the Toledo Terminal uh, Railway, which is a steam line. Um, if you notice this, building right here, in a minute I will show you today, is this building right here. There it is. There it is. Now, Star Avenue is here, but now Star Avenue goes under the rail line, and there's the other building, and there's a substation. So if you ever go out Star Avenue when you're going to the railroad, look to your left, and you will see part of the Ryan Station, which was right there. Okay, we're heading east now on uh, a long star, and if you're familiar with Star Avenue, you'll know that it is north of Pearson Park. And there's the, uh, one of the cars coming down uh, the track. This is Star Avenue here. Pearson Park is probably over to your right, because this is Lallendorf that's just crossing right here, and here's the tracks. Okay, and, um, uh, and it's yeah, Lallendorf and Star looking east. Another picture along Star Avenue um, and Pearson Park is, I'm not sure which way the train's going here, so Pearson Park's either on your left or your right, I'm not 100% sure, it's probably on your right because the road would be on your right. And here's the old track line. And at this point it was, I think, <clears throat> maybe late in the time because this had to be a, in, John has it labeled as the 1950s and I think it was because the, the passenger service, as we said, started, stopped in 1939. And then the track was torn up in 1946 from Clay Center clear to Marblehead. So the only track that was left was from Clay Center to Toledo. And so it was only freight. And so here is a freight car, a freight engine pulling a track, or pulling a freight car down this track. And as you can see, the track was getting pretty shaky at that point. It ran parallel to Wheeling Lake here. Yes. After it, after it got to here at Pearson Park, it turned, ran parallel Lake Erie for a couple miles until it got to Curtis. 
pulling into Curtis now, a, a winter scene there. There were, this is where the Wheeling Lake Erie and the Toledo Park Clinton Lakeside Railway joined or went beside each other. The bottom picture here is the inner urban station. There it is, and there it is. And then this is the Wheeling and Lake Erie station. So the tracks ran beside each other. Do you know, did they have a siding there? I think they, they did. I think they, I think they could actually, uh, could actually train, uh, change cars uh, and go from one track to another. But there's your streetcar coming in and there's your freight line over there. Wheeling and Lake Erie now is more popular. Yeah. Comes right through downtown Oak Harbor, north and south now. Here's a picture today. I took a, well, in 20, 2020. Same spot. Here's this little road right here is this little road right here that's now closed. Okay. So the station would have been right about here, uh, just before the, the viaduct. Um, we think this building here may be this building without the false front. We're not, John's not 100% sure on that, but we kind of think that that one is the same as this one. Uh, but we're looking, I guess you would say we're looking, uh, that would be west at that west. point. Yeah, west at that point from, uh, in downtown Curtis. And the building on down there would be the restaurant that they're not. Yeah, there's a, right there is a, there's a bar right there. That's the crazy lady. Yes. And then there's a, used to be a hotel right there. It's, a, it's now, I don't know if it's used or not. It was a restaurant for a while. Okay, now we, are, we, have, we have turned in Cur Curtis and we're coming straight south. And we're going toward Clay Center. This is Bolander Road. This is the track. You can see it goes right in front of these houses, this house. Uh, if these people wanted to stop to get on the streetcar, they just went out and flagged it down and they would stop and uh, buy their ticket and go wherever the car was going to. You can see at this point the track was fairly well maintained. There's no weeds, uh, it's in, in good shape. And again, you can see the power poles that f followed this track. And I always tell people, if you want to figure out where these tracks were, look for power poles. If you see power poles going through a field that you don't explain, it was probably a streetcar track that went that way. Again, this is nor north of, of Clay Center. Get my right clicker here. Okay, we get to Clay Center. You know how familiar you are with Clay Center, but it's a big quarry there. And um, so at Clay Center, we now join the, it's an interchange with what was called the Toledo Southwest, Southeastern Railway. And essentially, it was a railway that served the quarry. It came out of the quarry, came down, around and could go back up in here. So what it was done, it, it hauled stone out down here to, and this is the, we called it at that time, the Lakeshore in Michigan Southern, which is the New York Central, which goes right through Port Clinton now. And um, they could load stone or transfer the stone cars from their track onto the main steam line for being hauled away. Likewise, the inner urban could come and could join and haul stone this way if they needed to. So there was a lot of uh, crossovers, a lot of uh, um, joining right there in Clay Center. It was a, <clears throat> a very busy spot for, for both the steam line and for the, uh, uh, for the inner urban. Well, you they had 1,600 car loads of stone a year on the inner urban. So that's a lot, 1,600, 1600 car, car, car loads a year on the inner urban. Out of, out of Clay Center. Okay, we're back here now to Clay Center. Of course, they had to get across the New York Central Line or the Michigan uh, Lakeshore, Michigan Southern, LS and MS. Um, and they, so they built a trestle to take it across. And there's a picture of it. The, right here is this Toledo and Southeastern Line. And the New York Central Line is going underneath here and this is Bolander Road coming into, there's your trestle, and there's going across. And the only thing left of this today is, I think we think it'd be this size right here, um, the uh, abutment that's still there. And there it is. Right there is the abutment right along the tracks on Bolander Road, and there's the train going across, and there's, there's the abutment, there's your New York Central Line and your uh, the 
the, what was it called, the Toledo, Toledo Southeastern out of the quarry. Okay, now we're heading south, again, straight south out of Clay Center. And this is one spot where we do not follow the, along the road. We go through the field. And this is a picture of the line, probably taken um, somewhat late in the life of the line because it doesn't look in too good a shape. It's uh, uh, kind of weedy and probably didn't have too many cars on it um, in recent times. This picture is actually a little out of order. It, it, is, it was actually taken north of Clay Center. But what I wanted to show you on this, I'm standing on Wallbridge East Road. On this one, taking the same time, this one I'm looking north toward Curtis. This one, just turned around 180 degrees, this is looking south toward uh, Clay Center. So you can see, you can definitely follow the track line. There's your poles. Poles are here. This has, of course, been all cleaned up, and this is more of a woods and back more nature the way it was. Of course, the track is all gone. Okay, we've continued down. We are coming down now to, toward Route 51, north of Genoa, and we now join uh, the, the Lake Shore Line, which is the other interurban line that ran, <clears throat> as I said, from Toledo to Cleveland. Here is the, um, this is the, our line, the Toledo, Port Clinton, and Lakeside Railway Line, and this is the Lake Shore Line, <clears throat> and this is Route 51, and you're looking toward Genoa. You're going away from Toledo, looking toward Genoa. Okay, we're in Genoa now, and here's the, the cars making a turn. This used to be, well, it is, with Star and Lills. Uh, it's turning onto Washington Street. This is Route 51. You're looking southeast at this point. Star and Lills, which was just torn down maybe in the last, I don't know, within a few years. It, uh, I used to eat there quite a bit. It was, they had good pork chops. Um, but that would be the, tur the turning there. The, this line, the Lake Shore, actually turned a street earlier down Main Street in Genoa. So Genoa had two interurban lines going through it. One, the Lake Shore, the other one being the uh, Toledo Port Clinton Lakeside Railway. You can see that the Lake Shore was a more major line and probably better maintained than our Toledo Port Clinton and Lakeside. You can see there's some dips there, I bet. But that was a fun ride. You're probably bouncing all around on it. And here's that same picture that we saw earlier turning, and this is today. Now, this building's gone, but it made the turn right here, and uh, that building and this building, same spot. Okay, we're in Genoa now, coming down Washington Street, and this is the inner urban station. This would be on the east, east side of the tracks. Um, some, one of these buildings just burned here not too long ago, but um, it was the inner urban station. There's the inner urban line track. And Genoa was a was a, a, a the site of the car barns. They they needed places to repair these cars, to work on them and so forth. And when the line first began, it was in Genoa where they had the uh, the car barns. And from 1904 to 1915, that's where they were. And there is a picture. Oh, there's the Genoa station. Here's the track coming in from the north on Long Washington Street, and. Um, it, it goes on to Elmore, and then if you go that way. Uh, and it says, the sign reads, Cedar Point and Putin Bay, take the Toledo, Port Clinton, and Lakeside cars, which is what that sign right there says. So they were advertising. It says, also connecting with steamers, Falcon, and Columbus. So apparently you could catch your, catch your steamer at Lakeside or, and uh, go from there. <clears throat> Here's a, an aerial map or a sketch of the tracks. And again, they came down from the north, there was a spur that you could go to take over for the quarry if they wanted to pick up water, which is, of course electric didn't need it, but um, come down the track. Here was the car barns and then out along down to 163 eventually and on out of, out of town over to Route 51 and then your stations were right there. Okay, now we're going down Route 51. We are right here on this map. Um, <clears throat> crossing the uh, uh, Toussaint Creek. This is Route 51 right here. You're looking north toward 163, toward UNESCO's, which used to be the Blue Moon, if you're 
old enough to remember that. And uh, this is the, the track, another picture. This one we're looking south toward Elmore. This one we're looking north, same bridge. Here's an aerial shot today. Um, this is Route 51, and a bigger one here. This is, this is 51, and you're, you're crossing here, and, and the, the abutment, there's abutment still here if you, if you um, <clears throat> look at the right spot. And I wouldn't advise it because there's no place to pull off there, so I really didn't get an epic picture. <laughs> but uh, the, part of the abutment is, is still there. <clears throat> okay, now we're coming into Elmore, Route 51. Um, and you can see here is a, a cross buck. That means that the streetcar is coming down here and it's going to make a turn across Elmore, across 51 north of Elmore, and 105 crosses right there. That's the Lucky House. It's still there. There's a picture of it today. Uh, so the train is crossing. And here is the Elmore Station, right at the corner of 51 and 105. The Lucky House again, and the streetcar turning right in front of it. So it made a 90 de yeah, 90 degree turn uh, at, at 105. And there's the Elmore Station. And you can see the track coming in on 151 and making the turn <clears throat> onto 105. Now, this is a point of controversy. Um, this is the building that is there now. Uh, corner of 50, again, 51 and 105. Picture was taken in Elmore in 2000. This is the station. After it was no longer used in an urban station, it became a gas station, okay? There are people who say that they're the same building. And John and I say, no way. But there are some people in Elmore that say that it is. And I, I don't know. So what do you think? Is this building and this building the same? If it is, it's got some major modifications been done to it. It's the same location, same spot. But I... If, if there were enough the pitch is not new. No, the pitch is not. The whole roof had to, had to go. The, uh, now, this building and this building are definitely the same because you can see the little windows above here. Of course, the, the portico and stuff is gone now. It's just a porch. But anyhow, that, that's, that, that, uh, if you want to get an argument, why well, you, you can say that's not the same building because I don't think it is. Okay, uh, there were wrecks on the... That little white building with the little uh, slanted... Yes. Is that, in your opinion, then a um, station or? I don't think it is. I don't think this building and this building are the same building. They're the I, same I think location. It was built because there's a Girl Scout house it's, for ages. Yeah, and it was a it was a gas station before that. In in '45, interurban ended in '39. In '45, it was a gas station. Okay, and then of course they don't. It's not a gas, but that that portico was torn off porches there. You can see that, the, well, you can't really see. There's a chimney here. There's, there's a, a lot of similarities from this building to this building, but nothing to that building. So. Well, no matter who you ask about that little white building on the left, they'll tell you something different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we found that. Because we've never been able to determine what, except in the Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts, and like I said, it was a gas station. We do have documentation of that because of Kuhlman service station, but but prior to that, we don't know. And it's not that far back. You'd think somebody would be around to remember. Daryl? I used to walk to school from <clears throat> 51, which would be to the right, and pick up a bus at the corner of 105 and 51. And that was a gas station, mm -hmm. or a closed gas station, mm -hmm. by the time I was The Dark Ages. <laughs> you didn't write the interurban though, did you, Daryl? <laughs> okay, we did have wrecks, uh, several, and this was one of the more major ones. Um, it was at Linker's Curve. Linker's Curve was uh, just east of Elmore on 105 along the river. This happened uh, September 28, 1907. Uh, the box motor car number 41 and the Passenger car number 43, it was a foggy morning. Uh, the box motor car, this one, uh, was not supposed to be there, and it hit the passenger car head on. Uh, the Henry Null, the motorman of this car, was killed. Uh, I don't know how many injuries, injuries there were on the others, 
um, but it was uh, um, a fairly major, uh, one of the, it was the first major accident uh, recorded on, on, the, on the line. And we'll show you exactly where it was. Um, today, if you drive down 105, that used to be Stan's Body Shop. This is 105 right here. Um, Graytown Road is over here. Elliston Trowbridge Road is over here. Of course, this is the river north side. And uh, that's Stan's Body Shop. There used to be a barn right there. You can see where it's been torn down. That's what the, where the barn was. Um, there's the body shop. Now, if you look here, you see what looks like that's the line. That is your Toledo, Port Clinton, and Lakeside line. If you ever drive out there, the you'll, power, the power, lines. power lines are still there. This was Mr. Linker's farm, and his barn was here, and his house was here, and he didn't want any streetcars running between his place and the barn. So he made them go behind his barn. And what it did, and it was well, not that big a deal, really, but it created a, a fairly sharp curve right here where it turned and followed 105. And that's right there is where the accident occurred. A lot of people think it was here because there's a curve in the road, but it was really back here is where they where the accident occurred. And that's a kind of a picture of it today. Okay, we're coming into O'Carver now um, on 105. There's a the mausoleum, Union Cemetery. There's the track. There was a sidewalk there at that time. That sidewalk's not there anymore. But if you drive there, this is the what we would call the old side or the north side of the cemetery. Um, the track, that's where the track was. And you can still see the um, it's like a little driveway now, and you can still see the, the, the stone, bed is still stone there. bed's still there, yes. In fact, all along 105 from Old Carver Elmore, if, you're, if you watch what you're looking for, you can see the track bed, the air remnants of it, it's, it's still there. And here's today, same, same spot basically. And there's the track bed right there. And there's your poles. Again, if you, if you see the high poles, pretty good chance that's where the inner urban line, because the because the electric company still has the right of way for that area. Okay, now we're coming into Oak Harbor. There is the Wheeling and Lake Erie track in the background. This is the old armory, which was right here. This was, uh, was Link's blacksmith shop, but later it was Wood Electric and a few other things. Fire station is here. It's still a fire station, but it's much larger. Telephone company is here. Still the telephone company, well, it's not anymore, but it, it's, the building's still there. Uh, and here's the streetcar came right down the center of Water Street, across the track right there. And a diamond there going across the wheelie Yeah, I have a, a, another accident that I happened to find. Um, this is the exponent in October 20th, 1923. So it's a $125,000 railway wreck on Water Street. Uh, one man was slightly injured and the property damage was estimated to the extent of $125,000. About one o'clock Monday morning, so it had been the night, when a westbound Wheeling and Lake Erie train, so that had been, it'd be at that point going north, uh, crashed into a freight car uh, from the Northwest Ohio Railway, which would be the streetcar line uh, on that line. Apparently, the streetcar calling, hauling stone got hung up on the track and the train hit it. And it created, a, I guess it was. Some injuries, nobody, nobody killed, but a, a lot of damage. And I remember my mother telling me about, about that. She couldn't remember, she'd only been 11 at the time, but I remember she, she had talked about that. Because when they built Bassett's store right next to the track, she said, ah, that's a big mistake. She said, I've seen, I've seen train cars there before and they're laying sideways. So, so well, that's, that's never happened that's, since then, that's good. Yeah, okay. Okay, this is the same spot. There's your bottom picture again, same picture. That's what it looks like today. Fire station, there's the phone company there. Uh, buildings on this side are all gone. This is now community market over here. Again, your high power poles are coming right through here. And the track went right down the center of the street. Oh, hit the wrong one. There we go. <clears throat> okay, here's an interesting one. This was taken August 28th, 1904. This was the first paying line of the Toledo, Port Clinton, and Lakeside Railway. Now you might say, that's not a, electric. No, that's steam. They did not have the electric really hooked up yet. So this is the inaugural run, inaugural run 
put a steam engine on it. Remember, you could use steam. This tracks, tracks are built to steam standards, so you could run a steam engine on it. And if you look in the back, there are 600 people on those open cars. And they are on their way to Port Clinton to a baseball exhibition. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that would pass today. Um, <laughs> and as far as I know, everybody made it. I mean, I never heard anything bad about it, but they're just, they're just hanging on there to take, the, uh, to take the inaugural run to Port Clinton on August 28, 1904. And that's the same spot that we saw before, the fire station. Well, actually, the fire station is not, is, this is an old enough picture that fire station is not there yet. It would be kind of in front of where the, it'd be kind of over here. It's where the fire station is now. You know, I don't know. I, obviously, there was a rivalry between Oak Harbor and Port Clinton even back then. Of course, you guys stole the courthouse from us, so why not? You know? <laughs> okay, uh, this is the center, the center of town, uh, right at Church Street and Water Street. This was the, um, the station, and in the back is, oops, is the um, power plant. And you're coming down water and making the turn. And the other thing to point out, which John pointed out to me, is this was a brick building. It was the only brick building on the inner urban line. All the rest were wood. The stations were all wood. But Oak Harbor, in the 1890s sometime, uh, after a couple big fires. 1892. 1892, after some fires, they said that any new buildings built in the main street of Oak, or the main thoroughfare of Oak Harbor had to be built from brick. So they required this one to be built from brick, different than any of the others. And it's the same picture with a car just making the turn. And the sign says, take Toledo, Port Clinton, and Lakeside cars to Putten Bay, Marblehead, Cedar Point, Sandusky, and Camp Perry. A $1 from Toledo, Cedar Point and Sandusky every day. And that's the corner today. And that's the building, so it was right there. And another shot from the same spot. That's the same building we saw. This is a streetcar making the turn. This is fairly late, uh, probably in the late 30s. Um, this is the hotel still there. These buildings are all here, but these are all gone, and that's where the bank is now. Similar shot, only you're on Church Street, now looking north. Again, there's the hotel. This is the same building, but you're seeing it from the back. Streetcar made the turn, and here's the track getting right across the river. This corner right here, pay attention to it because you're going to see it again. Um, that's the corner of the Oak Harbor Hardware, the back corner off Mill Street. And it's still there, although it's covered with aluminum or metal siding now. Okay, this is a, a crazy picture, and it, it has not a whole lot to do with the inner urban other than you do have a track right there. But this is, this is Mill Street, which is now a street, but it was an alley then. This is Gordon Lumber. There's a river. There's a bridge. But this area now is all parking lots, and the, the, the uh, Krogan Colonial Bank is back, the branch is back in here. Um, and this is later where they built the, car, the old Carver car barns, but this had to be done prior to 1915 because the car barns aren't there, but the track is in. So it was after 1904, but before 19, 1915. But we'll get here in a, another picture in a minute of, well, I'll do the car barns. Coming in again here, make the turn. The hotel would be up here. There's your inner urban station. Coming down Church Street, pulling into the car barns here, down to Gordon Lumber here, spur, and then takes you across the, across the river. The car burned, burned in 63. 63. The mica, mica products went in there, which is a rubber, they made rubber, extruded rubber, and it caught fire in 63, and they were all, they all burned. But. I have the deeds to it. Do you? Uh, OLP Garden owned the building. <laughs> okay. Well, here's uh, some of the cars uh, at, the, uh, at the car barns. Nope, wrong way. And this is what we looked at earlier. And this is what it looks like today. And there is your same corner that I talked about before. There it is. There it is. Of course, the street is much wider than the alley was at that point. You got the wagon bridge back there. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's, 
That's the wagon bridge, which is not in the same location that the, thir that the current bridge on Route 19 is. Here is the uh, interurban bridge across the river. Uh, it was a triple span. There were three distinct spans. And then it had towers to for the electric wires. It did, the spans did, the center span opened. It was on a swivel because it was con still considered a navigable river. So you had to get, be able to get through there. So they had to be able to open the bridge. Although by the time these were built, I don't think it was opened a whole lot anymore. But this one is the center span and that turned when the center span turned. They came in and the, these things here, pilings, were when they would have an ice jam, it, it would hit that in order and it would keep the bridge from being damaged. Now we're on the other side of the river, we're looking north. Um, and this was prior to 1923, because in 1923, we'll show you there was a, another accident and um, took out one of the spans, which they never replaced. They just made a, another, a larger trestle. This area now is actually still there, but it's all been filled in. So if you drive over in that area, you'll see, looks like a, the river kind of um, <clears throat> has a, a dam or something right there, and that's all filled in. But there's the hotel, there's the hardware. The Butmans have both on both, both sides. Yeah. yeah, the Butmans are still there. Here was the accident, um, <clears throat> March 7th, 1923. Uh, William Pluckhorn's a guy, right? Yeah, William Pluckhorn was the, uh, was the uh, motorman, and uh, you'll hear his name in a little bit. Um, uh, apparently, the, one of the rear wheel trucks jumped off, caught a corner of the bridge span, and there's the car, and it just all went down. Um, amazingly, there were no injuries. Um, People that were on it said it was just very slow and it just kind of went over and they got out and everyone's was okay. But it did create a real mess to clean up and that stopped the line. And what they did then was they had, um, they would have buses, um, I guess, to, to, to take, a, take you around, I guess. I'm not sure how they, how they ended up doing it. Well, I know they, you'd, they would, you'd get off in Old Carver side, you'd take the bus on the highway side over and then get on the streetcar on the other side. Another picture of it and cleaning it up. They had to bring a crane in uh, from Toledo. And there's one of the cars they're picking up. And the crane, uh, yes. Uh, here's, the, here's the line now. You, this is today, 2020. There's the abutment where the tracks would have turned. Here's another abutment here. And here's that area that I said had the trestle that was filled in with, with dirt. Here's the track, which also later, still was route, route 19, used to come like this, turn here, and then the bridge went across here. So, um, but you can still see this road, and it, it went right here. Then it went on this side, and then crossed. I don't know if, but well, as you, it doesn't show here on the picture, but if you look right here, past Wistos Landscape, you will see poles that go right out through the field, and that is the streetcar line. Okay, we're on the south side of the river. We're heading east. Um, <clears throat> this building is called Union Hall, and I think it's just kind of a neat old picture. Union Hall was a big dance hall uh, on Portage River South Road, I guess it's called. And uh, there's advertisements in the exponent uh, about dance Saturday night at, at Union Hall, and uh, last car leaves at 11.30. You know, it's telling you if you're gonna take a streetcar, you've gotta be out there by 11.30. Um, we're not 100% sure, and I've talked to uh, Norm Witt, who lives out there. We're, we're not sure if we're looking south on Muddy Creek South Road, is it kind of, or we're, we're not sure. Um, but anyhow, that's approximately where it was uh, on Portage River South Road and Muddy, Muddy Creek, right? And then and, we straight across the road, down across the uh, Little Portage. Yes. They did have sidings, so if two cars had to pass, they could periodically. Um, this is crossing the Little Portage. Uh, on, they didn't build a bridge, they just built a trestle across there. And you still see the property on Norman Mix where the uh, area <coughs> Yes. This is the, the, where the bridge would have been, the trestle was. There's the pilings that were there. 
Okay, now we're, we're on uh, Dar Huffinger Road and we're making the turn onto Route 53. This house is still there. I'll show you a picture of it today in modern. This is Route 53. You're looking toward Port Clinton this way. This is coming in off Dar Huffinger Road and there's the track. And there it is today. There's the house. Here's the track would be coming down like this and then making the turn in front of that house. There's the house in, 20, in the early 20s and there it is today. And if you go out there today, you can still kind of see where that, where that went. Come into Port Clinton, you come in uh, Route 53. The track would have been on the north side and then eventually goes right down the center. And as we were talking, it, it turns right here and then makes a little jog and then comes down the center of 4th Street. There's the courthouse, there's where the old school was. Follows along, makes a little jog here and then heads out. This is uh, taken later. The track is still there, but it, I think it's in the process of being torn up or whatever. And this is Erie Gardens. Um, so we're guessing, what, late 40s, I suppose? Peggy, when would that have? Early 40s. Early 40s. So the line ended in 39, so this would probably have been after that. But uh, Erie Gardens was built for uh, people from uh, Camp Perry and Erie Army Depot. Okay, now we're in Port Clinton. Uh, here is the station. There's the courthouse. Uh, Fourth Street is here. Madison is here. Then the station moved to the west side of Madison. Same station, although enlarged. And by the way, this is not the little building that used to be a dentist office by the library. Some people say it is. It isn't. John confirmed that it is not. But um, this building was there. This house is still there. And this is where the station was, right here. There's that house. So the station would have been right here. Again, this is Madison Street. There's the railroad, <clears throat> 4th Street. It's kind of a, it's not the best picture, but it's an interesting picture. It's plowing snow. Uh, this is called the work motor car number 90. It had a snow blade on the front and is coming down uh, eastbound on Madison, eastbound on 4th Street, approaching Madison with its uh, plow and snow one winter. And they did have trouble keeping that, the lines open. They did have to, to plow them out because uh, the, the electric inner urbans didn't have the power to get through big, big snow drifts. Now when you get to the east side of Port Clinton, there's a little street called Shirley Lane. I think it might even be a private road, I'm not sure. But the, the track came in from the south Cross the New York Central or LSM and MS and went like that. It also, if you came from the other direction, you could come here and it would take you to the substation, electric substation, or you could go straight and you could join the, uh, the Lakeshore Michigan Southern. So again, you could transfer freight cars here. Um, so there was a, a real big interchange. There is an overpass abutment right here which I'll show you, it's still there. I'll show you in a minute. In fact, right there it is. There's Route 2 going across the tracks, east side of Port Clinton, and Shirley Lane is like right here, and there's an abutment right there, and there it is crossing over. Again, a shot of it uh, uh, going over the, the Lakeshore Michigan Southern. And there's, there's the power plant. Some of you may remember that. It was it's on Perry Street, um, kind of a, a crossed from, um, well, it's right next to Domino's Pizza, I think now, and uh, Dollar, Dollar General or something. Uh, Dollar, Tree. Dollar Tree. Yeah, there's Perry, makes where it used to make the turn, right there. There was a sub, you, you, the power pole, the substation's still there, and there's a ditch, that, right, which is still there, that comes, comes through. Pizza. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is labeled Jolly Rogers and it isn't. Jolly Rogers is now a little farther down. That's where it used to be. This is Domino's. This was, is, what you said, Dollar Tree or Dollar General? One of the Dollar, Dollar Tree. And then this is a ditch that ran back and this is a substation. The power plant sat right about here. This was. Is that actually for water for the power plant? Yes, yes. Um, taking electrical lines um, between uh, Port Clinton and Marblehead, just a, a work crew. And it, it shows we've got a lot of these pictures from the museum, Ottawa County Museum. They have wonderful, wonderful um, group pictures. Uh, we're now in Gypsum. 
There is the gyps old gypsum school. This is the road here. There is a station. If you look at the over map, there is the um, station. There is the church. There is the school. So right here is the driveway now to the airport. So the station for the interurban sits the same place as the driveway to enter to the Erie Ottawa Regional Airport. So it would have been right there. Car track would have gone right along there. There's the school, there's the church. Okay, now we're to, to the east. Um, we've got, uh, this is Port Clinton Eastern Road. Comes off of uh, old, uh, old Route 2, I guess you would say. And uh, here's Violet, a little town of Violet, which is, I guess, a little, this is Church Road. Now the streetcar line went, and I drove this today, and it's, it's amazing, you can still see the, the roadbed along here. Um, when it got here, it started out, it just went across, and the poles are still there. And it went here, and then right on up, and tied into, uh, Lake, is it Lakeshore Drive? Right, right here, there's the old line. The, the uh, Lakeshore Michigan Southern line, which was steam to for the serving the, the quarry and so forth. That one is here, and you can see right here the two joined, or they could transfer from one to the other. And then the, the Lakeside Marblehead went up this way. Engelbeck Road, this is Piccolo here, and again the R line, and it went right into um, it said Lake was East. What road is that one? North North Shore Boulevard. Yes which turns into 5th Street. Okay, we're coming now into Lakeside. There's the gate, that's the old station. And these were, uh, Linda, these, these were cars, there. these were soldiers getting ready for World War II? Uh, World War I. World War I, that's right, because right? it wouldn't have been there in two. two. Uh, but uh, yeah, they were, Linda provided us that picture and they're standing right there at the fence. Uh, and I guess these gates would close until the car would come and then they would open up. Yep. Oh, wait. 33. Okay, now we're at the Marblehead station. Um, and uh, sign reads, uh, in part, Cedar Point Comic Opera Company at the Opera House. Okay, remember what that looks like because the next picture is when the streetcar didn't stop and ran into it. And who was driving this? No other than Mr. Pluckhorn, who also fell into the Portage River. Oh, dear. Um, I guess you, if you got on the car and saw that the motorman was Pluckhorn, you probably wanted to get off. <laughs> but anyhow, he, he, tragically, he was killed in this. Uh, some, <clears throat> some say he fell asleep. Uh, some say he wasn't feeling well, maybe had a medical emergency or whatever, but he, uh, it did crash and he, and he was killed. So it took the station out and, and it, was not, it was not rebuilt, as I understand. More scenes of the, uh, of the accident. And that was the car down here, the same car after it was, it was repaired later. Now we're into Lakeside and Marblehead. We're coming in 5th, 4th, 4th, 5th, right? 5th, which turns into what, Prairie, I believe, when you get into Marblehead, and then makes a turn and would have ended then at the Marblehead station. Then it, they then used, um, some of the track from the Lakeside Marblehead Railway to extend it eventually down, all the way down to Bay Point, past the Old Mocker Dock there. And there's a picture of us at the, uh, at the Old Mocker Dock with the colorized one, but there's the streetcar, the ship come, or boat coming in across the... The boat was used before the bridge, because there wasn't a bridge across the... Uh, 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 get to That's right. Um, this is Olamacher Dock today, Lake, Lake Point Park. Now we're down to Bay Point. The end of the line, there's the bumper right down here at the end of the line, Bay Point Dock, the station. And uh, this was a ferry, um, 1912 it says on it. Now, that actually concludes the, the, the ride, but just a little more information. Uh, this is car number two, the actual Lakeside, uh, actual Port, Toledo Port Clinton Lakeside Railway car. It's been restored, 
It's down at Clarion Park in Dayton. I visited, in fact, I might have taken some of these pictures, but there's the car. It still says Toledo, Port Clinton and Lakeside Railway on it. Uh, it's certainly worth your time if you're interested in something like this to, to see what, uh, what it was like in, in uh, the, the teens uh, of, of riding a uh, luxury uh, as you went <clears throat> across to Ottawa County and into Toledo. There's also another museum in Worthington, Ohio, and they have two of our cars, car number 21 and car number 64. I went there a number of years ago. Uh, I think it's a work in progress down there. The, the, the last time I was there, you, you couldn't even get into it, so I'm not sure what the status of it is right now. There are a number of uh, publications. This one is, is a great one. It's George, George Hilton wrote it all about the Toledo Port Clinton Lakeside Railway. It has a lot of great information. Um, it is available at the Oak Harbor Library. Um, probably can be bought, or sorry, could be bought on eBay and so forth. And of course, Ottawa County Museum has a terrific uh, extensive collection of uh, Toledo Port Clinton and Lakeside Railway. We have Facebook sites. Um, in fact, John just texted me one that was on the, uh, uh, their Facebook site, they, and it says, uh, this was from the October 10th, 1940 Peninsula News. It says, cross ties are removed from the roadbed with a recently continued OPS interurban line. This week, this will clear 5th Street through Lakeside and Prairie Street and Marblehead, improving both places immensely. So that's when the tracks, tracks were torn out at that point. And you're right, some of those tracks were used for uh, steel as part of, the, part of the war effort. And I think that's it. So, any questions?